exist. It is in time that we were born, it is in time that we will die. If a human being understands the significance of time, the rules of time, the laws of time, the dharma of time, and is in tune with the dharma of time, he is 
not just a jaya, he is a vijaya too. He makes it here and he makes it elsewhere. One who is not in tune with the dharma of time, he will get crushed and crumpled by the process of life. Life is just a play of time. The ancient sages of this nation, the ancient seers and yogis of this region looked at time with enormous attention. Our idea of time is essentially because of the way we are connected with the immediate creation around us, which is the planet and the solar system. Today, as we sit here, we call this the night because the planet is rotating. In a few hours, we'll call this midnight. In few more hours, we will call this day only because the planet is spinning. The spin of the planet and the human body and the human energies and the human possibilities and the human destiny is so deeply entwined. If one does not understand the law that governs this, if one is not in tune with the dharma that governs this, he will be just spinning eternally. You know, if you spin around for some time, then you don't know where you're going. This is the state of most human beings because unknowingly they are spinning with the planet and then they don't know where they're going. The Surya Siddhant, which goes back into the Hori of time, estimated to be somewhere around fifteen to twenty-five thousand years ago, is talking about the speed of light as two thousand. 202 yojanas. In half a nimisha, one yojana, according to the modern units of measurement, would be nearly nine miles. One nimisha means sixteen by seventy-fifth of a second. If you multiply this, you get… this is the speed of light. He is talking about the speed of light or fifteen thousand years ago. And today we have arrived at the same numbers with great difficulty with all kinds of instrument. This is by simple observation of how the human system and the solar system functions together. The distances between the sun and the planet, the distances between the moon and the planet, and the way we rotate and the impact it has, all these things have been looked at with great care. Right now the diameter of the sun into 108 equals the distance between the sun and earth. This is Today's measurement, it goes exactly like that. The diameter of the moon into 108 equals the distance to the earth. You know why we put 108 beads in you, you must have lost quite a few of them by now. Out of sync. Like this I can go on with all kinds of fabulous fig figures. The most important thing is how the making of the time and the making of the human body are so deeply connected. If you… you know the planet is round and it has a slightly tilted orbit. If you take this orbit and as it travels, as it spins, here it forms a circle. To form this circle, Today we know it takes twenty-five thousand nine hundred and twenty years. This is the time taken. This tilt mainly happens because of the gravitational pull of the moon over the earth. And for it to exert that pressure,
continuously to get this uh, access to form a circle, it takes this many years. And that many years is called as the one cycle of yugas. Twenty-five thousand nine twenty by sixty, because sixty is the number of minutes, sixty is also the number of heartbeats you should have if you are healthy, will turn out to four thirty-two. Four thirty-two is a number that comes up in various uh, cultures, the Norse culture, the ancient Jewish culture, the Egyptian culture, the Mesopotamian culture and very much here is 432. Why this 432 is your heart beats 60 times a minute. If you are in a state of excitement, it may be doing more. If you are in a good health and in good condition, it beats 60 times. So sixty times into sixty, it's three thousand six hundred into twenty-four would be eighty-six thousand four hundred. This is what it would be. If you divide this by two, if you leave this out, it's again four thirty-two. If you take the number of breaths that you're taking per minute, can you check and tell me how many breaths you're taking per minute? If you're not in a state of heavy excitement, you're doing fifteen. If you are in a state of sadhana, you've done lots of sadhana, then you could be twelve, otherwise you will be fifteen. So, fifteen breaths per minute means into sixty per hour, that is nine hundred, twenty-four, that is twenty-one thousand six hundred. There is something called as a nautical mile, which is a real mile. That means when I say the real ma mile, it has something to do with the planet and the way it is. The other units of measurement that we have created has something to do with the ease with which we can calculate. So one nautical mile literally means, you know there are 360 degrees in a circle, all of you know this. So upon the planet, there are three hundred and sixty degrees. If this is the planet, if this is the equator, there are three hundred and sixty going up like this. Let's say if you take this one as one degree, in this there are sixty minutes. It's referred to as minutes. There are sixty minutes. These sixty minutes, that one minute accounts for one nautical mile. So that means the circumference of the earth at the equator is twenty-one thousand six hundred. That's how many breaths you take per day. The planet is not spinning on time, no good at all for us. If you are not in tune with it, still no good for you. I'm just trying to make you understand, time is not just a concept that we invented. Time is deep-rooted in the system, in the very way we are made. So, when we go into Mahabharat, there is so much talk about the yugas and how they function, the impact of time on human life. I want you to look at it from a different context. This is not something that somebody thought up. This is a very phenomenal and profound science. Yoga is always deeply involved with this. It is just that we don't believe in propounding theories about it, but by practice we are trying to attune the body to the times and spaces of the creation the way it is. Because without being in tune with this, you… you don't get very far. If you are not riding the time, you will live a mediocre life probably a very suffering life. Only if you are riding the time, you will live an extraordinary life, which is what a human being and the human brain is designed for. If you look at the orbit of the planet, the planet is here. 
In the yogic astronomy, we divide this orbit into 27 segments called nakshatras. Each of these divide into four equal sectors called padas or steps, marking the 108 steps that the sun and the moon take through heaven. These 27 positions of the sun in relation to the earth plays a significant role upon the planet. These 27 represent the faces of the moon from a Purnami to Amavasya and from Amavasya to Purnami. There are 27 segments. So as the planet is traveling, let us say from this nakshatra to this nakshatra, what is happening is the little moon is making its half a circle. As it goes to the next one, it completes the cycle and as this is happening, the human cycles within the human body are responding and corresponding to that. In a woman's body, it is very obviously there. Every 27.55 days, a cycle should happen in a woman's body if she has to be perfectly healthy. In the male body, it is happening in a different way. It is not so obvious and so manifest, but it is happening in a different way and the cycle is of a larger span because if it's a larger span and men don't have much arithmetic capabilities, they don't count. When was my last cycle? That is mainly because of arithmetic problems, but uh, otherwise this is happening. This is happening all the time in the solar system. This is happening in the larger universe with relation to the solar system and it is happening in this. So Pinda and Andanda, the microcosm and the macrocosm, both are playing the same game. But you tell me, who should play whose game? If you think the macrocosm is going to play your game, you will waste your life. If you play their game, your life will be greater beyond your expectation. Now Mahabharat, you need a certain context within yourself. This is a story which happened a little over five thousand years ago. 3140 BC, the, the war ended and 3102 BC, Krishna left his body. When the war ended, in about three to four months' time, the Kali Yuga began. When I say the Kali Yuga, in the moment of the solar system, I'm not talking about the moment of the planet. Now the solar system, here we are, we are a solar system, our sun is here and we are all around. This itself is moving in the universe. This moment takes twenty-five thousand and nine hundred and twenty years to complete this cycle. So, the larger star which is here inside this, the exact location, we do not know whether it is located centrally or somewhere to the side. From the effects and the way the climate changes and the way things happen upon the planet, we believe it is not in the center, it is… it could be somewhere here or it could be somewhere here. It may not be that large, but it's somewhere here, the big star or a big system around which our system is going around. Whenever our system comes to a closer influence with this system, suddenly all the creatures living in this system, they rise to greater possibilities. Whenever our system moves away from this, the creatures living in this system 
they come to the lowest level of possibility. When the creatures come to the lowest level of possibility, we say, this is Kali Yuga. Don't look so disappointed. <laughs> I will tell you some good news. So this division of yugas runs like this. If you divide this by two to split it into two halves, you will come 12,960. 12,960. So this is the journey from here to here. One half to cover the four yugas. It takes 12,960 years. The Satyuga lasts for 5,184 years. The Treta Yuga lasts for 3,888 years. The Dwapara Yuga will last for 2,592 years. The Kali Yuga lasts for 1,296 years. So if you add them up, you come to 12,960 to run the four yugas. Four yugas two times over is 25,920. The end of Krishna's era is 3,102 BCE. Right now, we are in 2012. That means this is 5,114 years since Krishna's era ended. If you take away 2,592 years, which is the cumulative number of years considering the two Kali Yugas, which is at the bottom of the ellipse, you get 2,522 years. The duration of Dwapar Yuga being 2592 years, we still have 70 years left for the completion of Dwapar Yuga. That means 2082 we will be completing Dwapar Yuga and moving into Treta Yuga. The world will go through another upheaval, not necessarily in terms of war, but we will go through upheaval probably in terms of a population explosion and natural calamities and move into the next era of well-being and upward moment of human consciousness. So if you go by this, here starts the Satyuga when it closest to the… our super sun, not our sun, the super sun. When we are closest to that, this is Satyuga. Here human mind will be at its highest capability. People's ability to know life, people's ability to communicate, people's ability to live joyfully will, it, will be at its highest possibility or in other words, we'll have sensible people. <laughs> That's all it takes to live well on this planet, all it takes is a bunch of sensible people, we can live well. So at this time, human ability to communicate at its best because when it's here, the ether in the existence will be very close in the atmosphere. Right now, the etheric sphere of the planet is risen to a certain point. There was a point when it was much higher, now it has come a little closer. So when it is Satyuga, when it is positioned like this, the ether will be very close. When ether is very close, if I want to say something to you, I don't have to say it. With my eyes closed, you know what I want to say. Now don't start imagining, <laughs> it's a danger <laughs> If the ether comes down a little bit but still high enough, then I don't if I close my eyes, you won't know what I'm doing, but if I open my eyes and look at you, you know what I'm saying. 
you can enhance the ether in so many ways, we'll look at that. If the ether comes down some more, you can know by breath. If you go into the forest, you will see, because visually you're mostly blocked, after some time you will see the most significant way of knowing things is only by smell. Most animals are living there knowing things only by smell. Because of such concentrated life energy, the ether is high. Because the ether is high, they don't have to see. They're not. If you talk, they'll get confused. When the ether is very low, you have to talk and talk and talk. Otherwise, they won't get it. Even if you talk, they won't get it. You have to knock and talk and knock and talk <laughs> to make them get it. Yes. So the etheric content in the atmosphere will determine how sensitive your ability to communicate is. To create etheric content, there are many things one can do. So this is why Krishna said, in Kali Yuga, which is down here, which is so far away from the super sun, the ether will be so low, <coughs> no point trying to teach them yoga, trying to teach them meditation, trying to teach them mantras, yantras, this, that, they won't get it. Just teach them devotion. If they're devout, then they will generate their own ether. There will be an etheric content in the atmosphere. Because of this, they will perceive. This is said thousands of years ago. They say functions like electricity, magnetism, realizing that the whole body is an electric structure and the whole universe is an electric structure will come naturally as the solar system moves closer. So right now we are moving into Treta Yuga, which is the second best time that can happen in this cycle. And Krishna also said, after over five thousand years, there will come a ten thousand year period, a fabulous time. We're still… we won't make it there, but we can set the foundations for it <laughs> that we can have the joy of creating an atmosphere where there will be a ten thousand year stretch of golden time upon the planet. This is not all predictions and conjecture, this has a very deep-rooted understanding with what happens with the human mind in relation to the planet on which we live. We don't just live on this planet, we are the planet. If you don't understand this today, you will understand this when you're buried. <laughs> planet understands that you are just a part of the planet. You think something else of yourself. So, a story begins because you have false ideas about yourself. Mahabharat is a grand misconception of human beings and their sufferings, their rise, their faults. It goes on and on simply because human beings are struggling to come in tune with it. Somebody is in tune with it, whatever he tries to say, everybody misunderstands, both who are on this side and that side. Because this is not something, life is not something that can be said. If you open your eyes, you can see the light. Simply, just like that, if this life opens up, if it can… it can feel life, it can become life, it cannot be told. Telling is only to inspire, telling is only to demesmerize you from your own self-mesmerism. <coughs> Every human being has hypnotized himself or herself into their own limitations and they believe this is it, this is it. If you undo that hypnotism, 
they will feel fearful because it is a limitless existence. So you will have to, if they are spinning this way, you have to spin them this way for some time, for them to feel they are going somewhere. The problem is, you are walking in this direction. If I tell you, you are walking the wrong way, oh, is that so? And you turn around and you start walking this way. If you are arrogant, you say, I don't care and you keep going and fall in the pit. But you are a gentle one, if you say you go… I, somebody says you are going the wrong way, you will turn around and walk this way. No, 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 not this way, you are going the wrong way. Oh, is this way? No, 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 you are just going the wrong way. That's difficult. So the whole Mahabharat is just this effort. No matter what they're doing, everybody thinks they're doing it for the good. My good, your good, somebody else's good, everybody else's good, whatever kind of good, everybody thinks they're doing it for the good. But everybody is neither good nor bad nor right nor wrong, it just goes on the story. So I want you to understand what it means to be living a story. Why are we taking these eight days to tell you this story? We could just give you a printed book, there are already many versions and I'm sure many of you come prepared reading three different versions. <laughs> I'm sure, there are scholarly ones I can see. No, we don't want you to read the story. We want you to live the story. So, the story is not about somebody. Mahabharat comes under the classification of being itihas. In India, we recognize the great texts in three categories. Itihas, Puran, Ved. Vedas are abstractions. Vedas are full of abstract ideas. Scientific theories, explanations for celestial happenings. Puranas are stories, but not of human beings, of other kinds of beings. Puranas are the stories of other type of beings, not of humankind. Itihasa is the story of the human being. When I say it is the story of the human being, itihasa should not be understood as his story. <laughs> there is a historic element to it. The facts are rooted in history, but this is my story. If it is his story, what meaning to your life? Only if it's your story, it is a process of growing up for you. What happens in a story like Mahabharat? The range of things that happen in a story like Mahabharat, the range of people, just to tell you the magnitude. The first version of Mahabharat that was written down by Ganapati himself had hundred thousand verses. When Vyasa wanted to tell the story and somebody had to write it down, he found no better chronicler than Ganapati himself. But Ganapati is bored of this scholarship business. He said, see, once I start writing, you should not even give a moment's gap. If I am writing, if I write this word, the next word should be already on. If you hesitate, I will leave and go, the project is off. You must keep telling the story in such a way that I should never have a break. Are you ready? So Vyasa said, fine, because this story is not something that I'm going to make up, this story is living in me. It will just find expression. Only thing is, you should not write a single word that you do not understand. 
They made a deal. <laughs> they made a very clever deal. And he narrated the story, these hundred thousand verses which depict over a few thousand characters. These characters are not guest appearances. Each one of them from their birth to death, all aspects of their life, their childhood, their marriage, their asceticism, their sadhana, their conquests, their miseries, their joys and their death. And for most of them, their previous lives and their next lives, in enormous detail. Putting Odyssey and Iliad together, this is about seven times longer than that. Did anybody last through Odyssey and, Ida, uh, uh, Odyssey and Iliad? Did anybody manage to read through, read through this, the Latin version? Most people won't last, they will just somewhere. By the time they read the introduction, it feel, they feel scholarly enough to give it up. So this is seven times longer than that. So definitely we will not be trying to cover the story as story is, but the story as it's relevant to you and me today. Because I want you to live through the story. I don't want you to sit in twenty-first century and make a judgment on people who lived here five thousand years ago, it's the most unfair thing to do. I am sure if they come alive now and look at you, they will have horrible judgments to make about you the very way you are. <laughs> yes or no? So it's not for you to sit here and make judgments. This is not about good, this is not about bad. This is not about the right thing and the wrong thing. This is about exploring the human creature like He's never been explored in any other place, just simply an exploration. So Vyasa, who was the author or who first told the story, took this challenge up because he wanted to see that the story lives. Since then, thousands of people have written their own Mahabharats with mild adaptations. There are adaptations to different states in the country, to different regions, different castes and creeds have adopted it in their own way, different uh, tribes, the tribal and the folk people have adapted in their own way. And every storyteller, when he stands up to tell the story, Looking at the crowd that is sitting in front of him, he's made his own adaptations. But the story is not contaminated with adaptations, it is only enriched with adaptations. Because the beauty of all these people in these five thousand years has been, nobody ever contaminated the story by trying to judge it. So you should not do it. You do not contaminate the story with your judgment. Oh, who is the good guy? Who is the bad guy in this? That's not how it is. These are just people. This dharma and adharma is not about right and wrong. This dharma and adharma is not about good and bad. It is not some kind of code of conduct for a king or a priest or the citizenry. It is a law that if you grasp it, it will allow you to move towards truth or untruth. This is what dharma and adharma is. So the story is a very powerful spiritual process. If you live the story, if you judge the story, it is a tremendous possibility for confusion in your life because after this you will not know what's good, 
what's bad, what to do in your life, what not to do in your life, whether to live in the family or go to the jungle, whether to fight a war or not to fight a war. <laughs> if you just live the story, you will understand, dharma means that which allows you to make this living process a stairway to the divine. Otherwise, you make this living process uh, uh, a spiral to hell. People are using it that way. People are using the process of living as a spiral to hell. Dharma is about learning to use the life process as a stairway to the divine. The time and the impact of time upon the system is very, very important. Right now, we are in an ascending time. Above all, we are in a cusp or the sandhya. The significance of sandhya in our day-to-day -day life, from day to night and night to day, from f f forenoon to noon and midnight, all these different sandhyas, we have been looking at this and those of you who made use of it know that it is significant. But now we are talking about the sandhyas between two yugas, two major formations of time which actually have a great impact on the way human body, human mind, human energy, this whole electrical system, how it wrapples with the electrical system of the creation, the universe in which we exist is towards a higher possibility. If you crackle with it, you will be one way. If you resist it, you will be another way. As the voltage increases, if you are the right kind of instrument, you will glow bright, otherwise you will poop out. At the same time, no matter which time, it does not matter which yuga, it does not matter which planetary position we are in right now, still individual human beings can rise above this, still indi individual beings can live in a golden time within themselves. That possibility has never been ruled out. In the worst of times, still an individual human being can be well about that. Everybody knows what happened on the la last part of Mahabharata, I want you to leave it. I want you to live through it because the beauty of the story and the beauty of your life, if you want to explore the beauty of your life, you have to explore the beauty of the story like this. A story is a tremendous opportunity that without going through all that, you can go through all that. Without a scratch on your body, you can fight a battle. What more? Human experience is largely shaped within himself, in his thought and his emotion. The more he becomes available, to an etheric sphere, the more he is in an energy space, his ability to shape his experience becomes better and better because the outside atmosphere is sensitive to it. Just now, Adiyogi is sitting here in full flow, no better place and he will not interfere. Even in Mahabharata, he was just there, people went to him, Whoever asked for whatever, he gave them. You asked for a boon, you got it. Tomorrow your enemy went and asked for a boon, he got it. Now you will think, is this my God? But that's how he is, so better be careful. Because he doesn't see you as a friend, nor does he see somebody else as an enemy. Because he's closed his two eyes, and he's got only one eye, so he can't distinguish who is who. Whoever comes with the right sense of receptivity, he gets it. You know it is a part of the tradition. 
that anywhere, if you want to create the right kind of atmosphere, the first thing that you do is light a lamp. Yes? Of course, because of all these problems that we are having, our nails are long and it's polished. We can't do this, so we… we put an electric light. But those of you who light a lamp, how many of you light a lamp every day? Oh, whoa, whoa, good. If you light a lamp and simply be there, don't believe in any damn God, just light a lamp and sit there. Does it make a difference? It need not be dark, it need not be visual… visual aid, but do you notice it makes some kind of a difference? Because the moment you light a lamp, once the flame is on, around the flame, not the flame itself, around the flame, a certain etheric sphere will naturally happen. So where there is an etheric sphere, sphere, there communication will be better. So you want to talk to God, you want to create the ambience first. Create a certain amount of etheric sphere and then talk to Him. Without it, you talk to Him bouncing back from the wall. How many of you have sit, sat around a campfire in your life? You will see stories told around a campfire always have the maximum impact on people. The storytellers of the York have always understood this, that stories told around the campfire are always the most effective stories. Receptivity will be at its best. We will create a situation that you are at the best of receptivity, both for the story and for the atmosphere that we will create around here. For this, we will go through a certain meditation. Hopefully, if time permits, we want to do this every evening so that it builds up that etheric content around you. If you are meditating enough, it will get taken care of. Fire is of different kinds. Life is fire. It's the fire of the sun which is life here. That fire can manifest in the system as Jetaragni. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? If you are hungry, that is Jetaragni, the fire of the belly and the fire of the groin. If Jetaragni is on and if this is fulfilled, only then the groin fire will burn. One who is not eaten is not bothered about sexuality. Only one who is eating well is concerned about these things. So these are the two same things. This is called as Jetaragni. If you transform this, Agni means fire. If you transform this, it can become chitagni. You became intellectually sharp, suddenly you have lost interest in sexuality, food and everybody is interested in what's cooking, what's cooking, who is going there, who is going here. You are not interested because your intellectual fire is on. Have you noticed this? Yes. At least in somebody. <laughs> so this is known as chitagni. Once chitagni is on, you will have to remind them when to eat. You have to remind them, you're married, man, your wife is waiting, you better go home. Ah, should I? Just one more thing. <laughs> because chitagni is on. This chitagni can be transformed into bhutagni. Bhutagni means elemental fire is on. A yogi, is on elemental fire. You have heard of yogis going underground and being buried for some time, breathless, heartbeatless. 
yogis consuming this, that, consuming mercury, <laughs> consuming <laughs> venom, all these things, and just to show off that they're yogis. <laughs> because if you are not, you will be dead. Unless your bhutagni is on, you can't play with the elements. There is something else called sarvagni. We will not go to that, that right now. These three dimensions, jataragni, everybody has to some extent. Chitagni, if it becomes, it becomes intellectually on. Intellect is like fire. If it's on, it's really like fire, it lights up your space. Do you see, even in the comic books and other things, somebody got an idea like a light bulb. Because when the intellectual fire is on, suddenly there is light. You can even make it heat because the fire is on. Now, if you have the elemental fire on, it is cool, but it's as hot as the sun. This is cool fire. This is of a different nature. Once you know the elemental fire or the bhutagni, you have mastery over the life process. You will choose how to be born, how to live, how to die or not die. Here in Mahabharat, you will face these three kinds of people. People who are just burning immense jataragni, wanting to eat, wanting to possess, wanting to copulate, wanting to conquer, immense jataragni, big people. And you will find some other people with phenomenal chitagni. Their intellect is such, they are able to see things that nobody else can see right now. Their intellect is such that they are seeing things what people will see a thousand years later. What ordinary people will see a thousand years later, they are seeing it now because Chitagni is on. There are other people who have Bhutagni, who have complete mastery over their life. When to be born, how to be born, how to live, when to die, even the very choice of life and death has come into their hands. These three types of people you will meet, don't judge them. All of them have a role to play. It is just that, along with the story, I would like you to make the use of this opportunity, if we can transform this Jataragni into Chitagni, Chitagni into Bhutagni. So we will do a, a simple… Now these days whenever I say simple, people are looking at me disapprovingly, okay. <laughs> you say simple and then you say… <laughs> okay. A basic, a basic form of Bhuta Shuddhi, which can bring a certain amount of Bhutagni into you. The beauty of having Bhutagni in you is, if you are on Bhutagni, on an elemental fire, you don't have to light a lamp in your life, you don't have to do a yagna or a homa, you don't have to worship, you don't have to enter a temple. I'm not saying you should not, I'm saying you need not. Because once the elemental fire is on, you are existence itself. You will see Krishna moving and playing between these three things. When he wants to be Jataragni, he is all out Jataragni. He eats and fights and laughs like nobody else. When he wants to be Chitagni, he is totally that, a visionary beyond compare. When he wants to be Bhutagni, he is absolute about that. So he will play all the three fields. 
I want you to at least touch all the three fields a little bit at least. Shall we make an attempt? Namaskaram Sadhguru. I'm a little confused about this theory of uh, yugas. Uh, generally they say in the Kali Yuga, Kalki avatar happens, but uh, you please elaborate on this. Oh, the white flying horse, it did not come, is that what you're waiting for? I'm not waiting. I'm not waiting for it, but the Puranas or the scriptures say so. So I just wanted to know about it. The Kali which means the age of darkness. In the cycle of the solar system, not in the cycle of the planet, in the cycle of the solar system, it does a cycle in twenty-five thousand nine hundred and twenty years. In this, if you divide it into half, there are four yugas and four yugas, totally eight yugas. Only the Kali and the Sat are coming together, paired together. Two Sat Yugas, two Kali Yugas. But the other two Yugas, the Dwapar Yuga and Treta Yuga are separated by Kali and Sat Yugas. Now this is… the Yuga that we're talking about is significant because of the distance that we create between the solar system and the super sun around which it is going around. The further away that it goes, lesser the intelligence of the beings here. So Kali Yuga is a time when there is maximum distance. Because of this maximum distance, the human intellect is at its lowest. And then as it starts moving closer, human intelligence will begin to blossom. Actually, they go to the extent of saying, that they will… human ability to understand and use the electrical and magnetic forces in the human system will get better as it gets closer and get worse as it gets further away. Today you know your intelligence is essentially how your neurons crackle in the brain, yes? If you see uh, a kind of a simulated image of the brain, you will see it's crackling around. Can we put this image? Do we have the brain image, blue brain project? Just… just put the blue brain thing on the Google search, it will come. So, you will see it's pulsating with crackling like electricity because how much electrical charge it can carry determines how well you can think, how clearly you can think. One thing that recently the physical scientists have come to, the yogic sciences have been saying this for a long time, the physical scientists have come to this, they are saying, looking at the physical laws that rule the solar system, they feel there is no room for further development of human brain. Why this is so is, if you increase the size of the neurons, it will become more capable, but it will take too much electricity. Right now as you sit here, twenty percent of the energy is being spent in your brain. Twenty percent of the calorie… calories are right now being burnt in your brain 
remaining eighty percent for such a big part of your body, twenty percent is spent only here in your brain because brain is a high power consuming part of your body. Suppose your brain became this big, you would need too much energy, you would need such a big stomach to accommodate that. I know some of you are trying but it doesn't work that way <laughs> That's not the way it works <laughs> If you… if you create such a big brain, you will not be able to supply power to it. If you increase the number of neurons, then you could still do better with the same amount of power. But if you increase the number of neurons, then the way it is packed right now, the clarity of signals will go away. This is the case with many hyperactive children. The number of neurons in their brain is higher than normal. They are brilliant but scattered all over the place. They can't think straight. They're brilliant in spurts but nothing comes out of it because there is no clarity. So if you increase the size, it doesn't work. If you increase the number, it doesn't work. So they're saying according to the physical laws, it is not possible for human brain to evolve further, but we can learn to use it better. Right now, the way we're using it is a very mediocre way. No, no, okay, this is… this is okay. Isn't there that neuronal thing? See, that's an electric charge going. All right, that's fine. So increasing the size of the brain or increasing the number of neurons are not possible, so they're coming to this conclusion that human intelligence cannot be enhanced, but it can be better used. Right now, the way we are using it is very mediocre. If more sophistication comes to the way you use it, you can increase your brain power, they're saying, approximately three thousand times than the way it is right now. Three thousand times more intelligent than the way you are right now would be incredible, isn't it? Three times more <laughs> would be fantastic <laughs> So we can learn to use it better, but we cannot evolve this brain further because the physical laws don't permit it. The yogic sciences have said this long time ago that human intelligence and human body cannot be developed further because we have reached… the physical laws have reached this limit because the way the earth rotates around the sun and the way the moon cycles around the earth, all these things we have reached, human body has reached that potential, it cannot go further. But at the same time, yogic sciences once again say, but your ability to use it can be enhanced by doing variety of things. One of the things that we spoke about just now is brahmacharya, that is you can generate that kind of energy in the system that if you had ten brains, it could still power it. If you have twenty-five brains, it could still power it. You could sit here and power one thousand brains which are sitting around you by generating the necessary energy, by raising the kundalini, by bringing your energies to full force. You can power a thousand brains if you want. That much energy is there. So we said there are sages who are referred to as people who had thousand hands, ten thousand hands. Why they… it is being said is, what ten thousand men could do, one man is doing. In many ways, modern technology just represents that, you know. But in a much more internalized way, a human being can be in such a way that his intelligence could cover for a thousand people or ten thousand people or a million people because there is another way of generating more efficient energy within the system. The scientists are looking at how body generates energy in its normal condition and they're saying, if you have a little bigger brain, you will, won't be able to supply power to it. But there are other ways to generate 
and you don't need a bigger brain, you don't need more neurons, you need more energy. If you had more energy, more refined energy, you would see, see, if you had to light this hall, there was a time you need five thousand watt bulbs we were using. Today you use a hundred watt halite, it's on. Now this hall is going to get, one of our meditators is sending it from United States to us, he manufactures the very powerful LED lamps. These bulbs will… are twelve old, okay? Twelve old bulbs, they're going to light up the whole hall. This was unthinkable just five years ago, with twelve old bulbs you're going to light up such a big hall, we are going to do it. So with very little power, we are lighting up things because the way we use the power and the refinement of how it happens enhances our ability to use it. What goes for a LED lamp definitely goes for the human body and human brain. So that's what yoga is constantly exploring. So Kalki is uh, to come to end the age. To end the age of darkness, he's supposed to come. See, the nature of time is such, nobody need to begin it, nobody need to end it, it goes on anyway. Nothing may happen to you in your life, but time will pass, isn't it? <laughs> There's one thing you can be guaranteed of. In case you get some boon and become immortal, you may even become immortal, but you can't stop time from passing on, isn't it? So nobody has to begin an age and end an age. It is just that they said Kalki will come on a white horse, winged. So if horse has wings, it's a no good horse. Horse should have good legs. Am I saying something wrong? <laughs> a horse should have four good legs, that's a good horse. A horse which has wings is a lousy horse. Yes or no? So obviously they were talking about a white horse metaphorically, not as a horse horse. It is a metaphoric thing that brightness will arrive. When the age passes, the darkness will move out and brightness will arrive and it will destroy the darkness. If you… if the hall is dark right now, if I turn on a light, does it destroy the darkness? What is spoken metaphorically? What is expressed dialectically? Foolish scholars or exploiters along the way make it all into black and white facts, made up facts. It is a metaphorical expression. As the solar system moves, it moves into a dark face and as it moves out, light arises. It will… it will rain upon us. Even if you don't want to be, suddenly your brain will crackle and work better because you moved into a different age. As we were saying this yesterday, even today, even in a comic book, even in a child's mind, my intelligence worked means light. Yes or no? Isn't it so? I got a bright idea, bright idea, not a dark idea, understand? <laughs> because intelligence, always human beings have associated with light. So, the scripture said, once the solar system moves out of this, a brightness will arise. This is very beautifully expressed. In the different yugas, human beings use different dimensions of intelligence, different dimensions of communication. In the Satyuga, mind will be more important. Mind, not intellect, mind will be more important. Probably 
this is the only culture where we make a distinction between mind and intellect. Today modern scientists have started doing it for the first time in the last decade or so. Otherwise, mind was just one thing. So the mind will be the main thing of communication and living. That is, if I want to say something to you, I don't need a microphone, nor do I have to shout at you like this. If I th think about this, you get it. In Satyuga, people barely spoke because mind was the means of communication. Everything that had to be done was just done mentally. Because it was all done mentally, they say even conception happened mentally. They go to the extent of saying there was no physical conception, it happened mentally. Then when they moved into the Treta Yuga, eyes became important. So you will see when life moved into Treta Yuga, the language of people who lived in Treta Yuga are talking always about one of the basic greetings in India was, I see you. I think the recently this Hollywood movie made this very popular, I see you, avatar. The basic greeting in this country was, I see you. Okay, you see me, so what? <laughs> no, that's not it. I see you means I see you through and through. When I went to school, believe me, I did. <laughs> I believed in giving the teacher some respite, so I did not go every day, but I did go. <laughs> so when I went to school, this happened to me. Before I went to school, this happened to me, kind of, that is, I started staring at everything because I don't know what it is, I'm just staring and staring. So in that condition I also went to school, so I stared. I've told you this many times, initially I heard the words, after that words didn't mean anything to me because I knew that I'm making up the meanings. Then the sounds meant something to me, after that sounds didn't mean anything, I was still staring. I, I was staring not because the teachers were always pretty or something, no, not always. <laughs> I was just staring because I did not know how else to grasp anything. If I want to grasp anything, I just stared. And when I stared keenly enough, the things I knew about them, I just knew them through and through like they wouldn't know themselves about their life. I would just know everything about them. I just stared and it became more and more absorbing. It just held me for hours on end, just staring at something because I knew more about it than listening to them. Listening to them never made any sense to me. So, in Treta Yuga, people said, I see because eyes became dominant. From mind they shifted down to eyes. It took me a lot of time to close my eyes and not be bothered about seeing. Earlier I was just seeing, staring, staring. If I want to know something, I have to stare. After some time I realized there are better ways to do it. If I want to know something, I just have to close my eyes. So Treta, people use their eyes powerfully. This is called as netra sparsha, that you can touch somebody with your eyes. When it moved further down, the breath became very important. We were already looking at this, probably today morning or yesterday, that wherever the life energies are very high, there you will see your sense of smell will become very, very strong and sensitive. You will see this in the forest. Your sense of smell is more important than your eyes, ears and your brain. You know, really. 
means you can just know what's happening with the person, in the sense. Now, uh, a few months ago, a month ago, we had the fortune of having a guest in the ashram who was a king cobra. Now, he uses his ma, tongue, to taste you from a distance. He knows the chemistry of who you are. Well, myself and a few of the brahmacharis are handling this. He looks like a pet cobra, he was just playing with him. But he is not a pet, he is deadly. If he… he can move so quickly and if he bites you, you have just eight to ten minutes. So you have just eight to ten minutes, that's all it gives you. It's deadly, it has enough venom to kill an elephant. But we are at ease with it because we understand that if you don't create the wrong chemistry in your system, he is fine with you. Cobra is the only creature who is so sensitive to your chemistry. All carnivorous animals and almost all wild creatures are sensitive to your chemistry, but particularly a snake is super sensitive. You can go in the wild and just pick up a venomous snake like this, not by the head catching like this, no, just like this. He will simply come if you are at total ease. If you show a little anxiety, if your chemistry shows little anxiety, little fear, that's it, he'll go for you because he instantly knows what is happening in your system. So, he's perceiving this in a certain way. The reason why the yogis are always keeping a cobra next to them and the Shiva has cobra next to him is in terms of the creatures that are available on this planet, a cobra has maximum amount of etheric aura around him. That means he is fabulous perception. So, for perception, this particular animal is helpful and his perception is something that all yogis bow down to because his perception is even better than most human beings ever can be because of the etheric aura that he creates around himself. So you will see in the story there are many tribes which call them nagas, they have the necessary uh, sadhana going to generate a certain amount of etheric aura so that they can perceive what others cannot perceive because only what you perceive you know, the rest is all rubbish. Yes? It may be said by me, it may be said by a god, it may be written in a scripture, but it is all rubbish unless you perceive it. These dimensions of perception, mental perception, visual perception by smell, and now when it comes to Kali, human beings become totally verbal, their mouth becomes the biggest thing. So you need to understand this, the solar system is going through the yugas like this. If you are in tune with it, you are also going with these yugas. If you are above it, you can stay wherever you want. If you are stuck in your own things, the planet may be in Satyuga, you may be in your Kali Yuga. So every individual is still free to either transcend the Yuga or be trampled by the yuga or ride the yuga as it is. All the three possibilities are there. So Kali or the end of the Kali, Kalki is supposed to come down on a white horse with wings. Don't get yourself a horse with wings, get yourself a horse with legs. This is funny, isn't it? But it was metaphorically spoken because the light or the intelligence need not necessarily come from you, it is coming because of a heavenly possibility. Because the solar system is moving out of that face, your intelligence will come out bright and it's a gift from nature. It is dropping upon you, it is a celestial gift. Because it's a celestial gift and there are certain constellations which are seen as a flying horse, you know this?
There are certain constellations which are seen as a flying horse. They said it will descend upon you and destroy your darkness. If you want to destroy darkness, nobody needs to fly on a horse and come down. If you just turn on a small light, darkness gets destroyed. Darkness is the most fragile thing. But even that people can't get rid of because they're employing wrong methods. Suppose we turn off the light and it's dark and you decide, suppose this hall is dirty, if I tell you clean it up, all of you with great enthusiasm if you go, probably in fifteen minutes time you can have the hall cleaned up. Now the hall is dark, then I tell you get this damn darkness out. If all of you with grow, go with great enthusiasm, till you die, if you do, still it will not go. But if we turn on a light, it will go. That is the nature of darkness. That is why a light being on a flying horse came down and took away the darkness. Unless you have still allowed it to live within you.